Hi, I'm Anthony Mangano, and today, today we're in Flushing, Queens to visit Mary's Nativity Church. So let's go inside and meet Father Kacherka. Come on. Welcome back to City of Churches today. Today we're with Father Edward Kucherka here, the pastor of Mary's Nativity St. Anne's Church here in Flushing, Queens, New York. Father, I want to thank you so much for inviting us here to this beautiful church. You're very welcome. I have a whole list of questions here and our viewers want to know about. So I'm going to just jump right in there and ask you, okay? I mean, this is such a beautiful church. It's a modern church. And when was it built? The church was built back in the early 1960s and it was dedicated in March of 1965 by Archbishop Magentager. They had a very small little wooden church sitting on the site and the Catholic community at that time was growing by leaps and bounds and they were having masses elsewhere because they couldn't fit everybody in the church and they made a decision to uh, take down the old wooden church that was here and replace it with this, uh, this beautiful structure that we have now here. When was the parish founded? The parish was founded back in 1926. There was a need for a, um, a community in this area called Casina Park. So uh, essentially they took a section of St. Michael's Parish and sectioned it off and it became this parish here known as Mary's Nativity. Father, as you said, when they, when they tore down uh, this church and built the new church in that period of time, where did the uh, parishioners go to worship? In the uh, school auditorium. They set up the auditorium in the school as a temporary church and celebrated liturgy there until this magnificent structure was built. And the school auditorium is adjacent to? It's right across the street uh, oh. on the other side of the church here on Jasmine Avenue. What type of church building was here in the beginning? From the pictures I, I saw, it was a small country style church. Mm -hmm. Wooden walls, wooden roof with you know the beams and stuff inside the ceiling and stuff you could see and everything else. From what I understand what people are telling me is very much similar to the church we have over at St. Anne. The style and the structure was basically somewhat the same. Eventually, this was what was built from it. Exactly. Father, as you were saying that Mary's Nativity has a sister church, St. Anne's. Correct. How far are they apart from each other? And, and are the parishioners go to both parishes or? Well, what happened was um, when Bishop DiMarzio uh, started that uh, initiative of Christ Jesus Our Hope in order to uh, consolidate and make the diocese more structured and, and work better. We were approached, because I was the pastor of St. Anne at the time, with the possibility of the possibility of merging the parish of St. Anne and Mary's Nativity together. So we were involved with that initiative and uh, I met with Bishop, uh, now Bishop, but then Monsignor Scharfenberger to discuss the whole possibility. And there was a committee, and then there was a committee formed within both parishes at the time to collaborate, sit and talk and think about what the needs of each parish were and what the need is of the greater community. And finally then they decided after t talking to everybody that the merger would take place and Bishop DiMarzio had to go into effect in January of 2012. So both parishes were technically suppressed canonically, then re-raised up in, as one parish but we didn't close either worship site. What I've noticed is that over the years in a lot of communities, a lot of little different churches I go to, they've been combining a lot of churches, and so to speak, because I noticed the parishioners that come change over the years. Some of the churches with the, which had the schools adjacent to it, a lot of the schools closed, which is sad in itself. Has the parishioners changed over the years? I mean, when it first started, till now what we have, and now that you've joined, which we're here in St. Anne. When I came to Flushing in 2008, both schools were open, mm -hmm. and now it's 2017, and both schools, both school buildings are now closed. Such a shame. But, but we do have, uh, we share the academy in the region over at St. Michael's with, the, it's St. Michael's, uh, St. John Vianney, and our parish. So the three parishes together send children there, and we have everything in the academy in the school building over at St. Michael's Parish, which is next door to us here. I have seen a change in the neighborhood with some of our older parishioners either moving out because of age, they have to start living with their children or whatever, and, you know, and other people have gone home to the Lord. Okay. But we do have an influx of new people coming in. We have a varied uh, variety. I called my parish People ask me, what's the ethnic break, uh, breakdown of your parish? And I say, we're the United Nations. Because we have mass in English, we have mass in Tagalog, we have mass in Spanish, we have mass in Urdu. We also had a mass for a while in Armenian. Because wow. we had an Armenian priest here. But um, 
Father Thomas was sent by his bishop down to Philadelphia, so we don't have that Mass anymore. And occasionally we do uh, help other people out with ethnic languages when there's a funeral or a special event or something. If I was to have languages and masses for all the people who were living in the parish, I could probably have like almost 40 languages. Wow. That would be, because, you'd have I mean, to have I mean, I mean, we have Irish in the parish, we have Italian, we have Polish, we have German, we have Chinese, we have Korean. And with the Chinese again, you have the two dialects. We have a whole smorgasbord of different ethnicities in the parish here. I'm just thinking you'd have to be up there and it would be like the UN, everybody in here, the different language would have headsets on it, just, just being interpreted well, in their well, language. The, my, my first year here in 2008, when I had the Thanksgiving Mass at St. Anne, uh, we decided to have the prayer of the faithful with one petition done in the languages that were spoken by people. I had 28 people up there. Wow, 28 people. How long, did, oh God, it, One petition, it lasted a little bit, but you know, it was wonderful to hear the richness of the culture of the area and people not realizing that, you know, it's a changing neighborhood and such, but there's such a variation of people living within, you know, steps of each other. Knowing, I, you know, everybody, most people speaking English, but no idea is saying, oh wow, that person speaks Gaelic, that person speaks German, that person speaks Polish. It's like, you know, it's, it's an amazing flux of uh, people in the area here. That's amazing, because usually you, 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 in a lot of areas that I've seen as we've gone from ch changed, the, the demographics changed. You know, we started with Italian, Irish, German, Polish, and now basically you'll have Spanish, Korean, uh, a Chinese. wide Chinese, a wide variety of right. different parishes, which is great that we have parishes. And I yeah. know people move away, they move different locations and they pass on. But that's great to hear that this particular church has that kind of uh, like uh, you know, the melting pot or the UN as you would call right. it in the United Nations. That's pretty great. The design of this church is amazing. You know, I go to all these churches and each one amazes me, the design. Do you know who the architect is? I don't remember the name of the architect, but this whole thing was planned out so beautifully. Church is dedicated to the birth of Mary, Mary's nativity, which is celebrated every year on September 8th. And we have a, a big liturgy here to celebrate that feast day. But if you just look around this, this beautiful church here, you got the rose window above the choir loft, which represents, you know, the purity and the simplicity of Mary. The ceiling, the arches, the design of them. Do you know anything about why it was designed in okay. this way? Most churches, if you look at them, okay, they have some type of beam and structure to it. Mm -hmm. And the tradition behind that, it goes back to the book of Genesis, Noah and the ark. It's an inverted hull. Ark, upside down. Exactly. Oh, yeah, you know what? And, now that you say it, that, I get Because we, we all share the journey. It's like taking the ship and turning it upside, upside down. down. And there you have the, the ribs of the, uh, the ship and the outside of the hull attached to it. It represents us on that journey towards salvation. I would have never known that. And then now that you said that that's amazing because when you look at it, you're right. If you, if you take a ship and turn it upside down, down, this is what we'd be looking at. I was like the Poseidon adventure from when you were a kid. I did a little research. I also think that it, it, can, it holds and contributes in keeping the echo from repeating itself, right. which I would guess that would be kind no of crazy. Reverberation. I happen to love stained glass, and anyone that watches the show knows that I think it's the Bible come to life, the designs that went into it, because the amount of work that's gone into these things, the detail is amazing. And I noticed that oh, they, they're quite different. I mean, the five, three, four, five on this side, and then there's five on this side, and then there's four. Mm -hmm. The peoples, what would you call it? It represents the people. Of the God. church, the parish, the people, people, people of God. God. Because you could see that it's not biblical, so to speak, as telling the story, mm -hmm. but you could see uh, a person getting communion, you see a person right. getting married, which I, I find fascinating, and, and they're so, they're so lifelike. But can you tell us about these particular ones on this side, and then, and then we'll go to that okay. side? Well, all of the windows, mm -hmm. what they do is they explain the role of Mary in redemption. Okay you know, how she, you know, was the mother of God and how she is portrayed to the scriptures, you know, being the one being called to bring forth 
the Christ child, the Son of God, into the world, and how she played a role in all of that from the very beginning. Like in the book of Revelation, it talks about, you know, how she's the new Eve. So that's why you start with the Garden of Eden, and Mary is there with Adam and Eve in this particular window, and then all throughout salvation history up to the birth of Jesus. And then on the other side of the church here, it's Mary's role in the history of the church like the great window over here with the Council of Ephesus, where Mary was declared the mother of God. Okay. And when Bishop Caggiano came here to install me as pastor of the new parish, that was his favorite window because he did his doctoral thesis on the Council of Ephesus. So when he saw that window, he, was, he fell in love with that window so it's much a, right away. It's a beautiful window. I mean, they're all yeah. beautiful. That's what I was saying to you is that that's why when I, when I go into churches, it's, it's one of my favorite things. And you know, that when they designed it years ago, that when the light would come in, and when the light comes in, it's like the, the, the Bible's opening up right. and telling a complete story right there in front of your exactly. eyes. Exactly. And then the smaller windows above the confessionals and the doorways here, the seven sacraments. Okay. You know, in the window over here, you have marriage and baptism, okay. family life. And this other window over here, you have the sacraments of initiation, penance, first communion, and confirmation. And then over in this window here, you have uh, holy orders, ordination, people who become priests and also religious, and how they serve the people of God. Wow. On this window over here, you have the anointing of the sick and how we all work and help each other uh, in life on our journey towards God. And the smaller windows that are throughout the church also play an important story because the Eucharist is reserved in a chapel on the side the way the church was built. And there's the windows there of, about Eucharist and Jesus being present in the Eucharist. So you have, you know, Melchizedek, the great high priest from the Old Testament offering bread and wine. You also have Abraham trying to slay his son and the angel stopping him. Again, sacrifice, what it's Eucharist, it's about sacrifice. And in the vestibules here on the sides, the pastor who built the church, I believe it was Father Donnelly, uh, he had great devotion to St. Thomas More. So in the windows on the Holly Avenue side, you have all these windows dedicated to St. Thomas More. And then on the other side, uh, going on the, the Jasmine Avenue, it's all about Elizabeth Ann Seton, who later became the first American saint. And it's also funny too, in both of the vestibules, on the one side you have St. Anne, the mother of Mary. The other side you have St. Joachim, the father of, of St. Anne. And the St. Anne window is on the side closest going towards St. Anne Church, which I find very very appropriate as well. Yeah, that, that is appropriate facing that way. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the baldacchino. Is that the original baldacchino was yes. here? Wow, it's absolutely beautiful. You don't see them in a lot of churches. You see them in some, some you don't. Right. The reason why I bring that up is because the stained glass window behind it is very modern and very abstract. I guess that was just something different to bring light into the church? I believe so. Well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And now to jump from that end, I'm gonna have to go to this and I see the Madonna. Yes. That's beautiful. Yes, that was the original window that hung in the sanctuary over the main altar in the original wooden church that was here. So to show the continuity between the two church buildings and the continuation of the parish, they had that window removed and when they built the church here, they made sure that it was installed there. I mean, to look at it, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you were saying before about the rose? Um, the rose window. That's absolutely beautiful. Look at the work that went into that. It's probably a quote from Ecclesiastes where it says, I shall bud forth as the rose. Mm -hmm. And you know, Mary's referred to as the, as the rose sometimes. It almost has like a kaleidoscope look to it. You know when you look through a kaleidoscope because it's coming out and I'm just picturing that in my mind and the rose, would, the rose would come at you while the surrounding area would turn. As a matter of fact, on the outside of the building, quotes that I shall bud forth as the rose and everything else that's written on the outside of the church on either side of the window, there's quotes up on the wall. Now, is that the original organ from 1965? Yes. Does it still function? It still plays beautifully. Uh, from what I understand, because I'm not an organist, I'm not a, a great musician, it's incomplete. They never finished putting everything into it, but it plays beautifully. That's like yeah. having a car and missing one part yeah. and it still runs. That's yeah. pretty cool that it actually works that way. Yeah. You know, we've gone to a couple of churches where they had to uh, refurbish and, and, and restore it, and I understand that it is such... It's very expensive. Expensive because a lot of it they have to redesign the part. They mm -hmm. have to take a picture or they have to take the right. part and then redo it, I guess, mm -hmm. through computers and sketches and stuff, which to me and, is and, amazing. And the other, the other thing too is a lot of the gifted artisans who maintain and build these things 
are very few far in between now too. Yeah, sure. But that's amazing for our viewers. You got to admit, you have an organ that's missing parts that still plays beautiful. I guess that's an act of God right there. Yeah. It's a miracle right there in yeah, itself. Yeah, it works. If it's not broke, don't fix it. It's fine. Exactly, exactly. You don't want to even touch it. Now, I look at the Stations of the Cross. It's like a medallion sticking out on the crucifix. Each church is amazing. They each have their own design. Can you explain to us a little bit about that? Each disc obviously represents one of the stations mm -hmm. and it, it describes whatever particular station it is. And um, there was an artist uh, whose name I don't know designed each of these discs. When we redid the Stations of the Cross with the gold leaf, it was uh, originally terracotta. And what happened was when we redid it with the gold leaf, we found out that uh, there was more involved what the artist did with the terracotta. Because when the gold leaf was applied, especially on the 14th station, where Jesus is placed in the tomb, you're able to see the city of Jerusalem in the background and Calvary with the three crosses on top of the hill. Very beautifully showing that, you know, sometimes you have to tweak things a little bit in order to make it come out even more beautiful. You know, you're in a church and then these things happen. You have to say they mm -hmm. have to be like an act, I say an act of God, a miracle in itself. You know, you have an organ that's missing parts that plays great. You have the stations of the cross that you redid and all of a sudden they come to life. There's a force there behind all this to prove a point. Yeah. I've always noticed now most churches, they've moved the baptismal font closer to the church or in the middle of the church. From what I've been told by other priests and my seniors that they, they were trying to include letting the parishioners see the baptism of a newborn. Now, I think yours is in the back there. It's absolutely beautiful too. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first came here, the font was in front of the Pieta. Really? Yes. One of my predecessors had moved it out of the baptistry and put it out in front of the Pieta. And in looking at the number of baptisms we do and how beautiful this church is, that baptistry, I'm sure you went inside and looked at it, those stained glass windows that are within the baptistry mm -hmm. with uh, John the Baptist, Jesus with uh, being baptized and his resurrection, which those windows absolutely tell the whole story of what baptism is all about. I felt I needed to put the font back in the baptistry and that's where it is now and we do all our baptisms in the, uh, the baptistry. For that reason alone, I can understand that. You know, the visual sighting of the whole thing, because windows were meant to tell a story. If we're trying to teach people about our faith, whether it's in increasing it or just teaching it to new people, you know, who don't understand the faith or know nothing of our faith, the windows tell a whole story right there. That's what I say in each, in each yeah. episode. That's why I love stained glass because it's the Bible comes to life. As you look yeah. at it, you go, oh wow, look at that. And that makes a lot of sense having the baptismal font mm -hmm. back there because those windows are gorgeous. Now, when we come back, we're gonna take a little break. I wanna talk to you more about the Pieta that you were talking about because I find that very fascinating. So we'll be right back. Well, welcome back. And right now, Father Kacherka is going to show us something very unique here at Mary's Nativity St. Anne Parish. Father? When this present church structure was being built back in the early 60s, uh, it was known that in 1964-65, the World's Fair was going to be taking place down the road here in Flushing Meadow Park. And in the park was going to be the Vatican Pavilion. And it was requested to Pope Paul VI at the time if he would be willing to send Michelangelo's masterpiece, the Pieta, from St. Peter's and bring it here to the United States to be the central part of the Vatican Pavilion. And he said, okay, and it's a beautiful story, which I'm not gonna go into about how it was miraculously packed in a crate, put on the deck of an ocean liner with all kinds of electronic gear in case the ship sank. The statue would be able to float in the water with a, a signal so they could retrieve the statue. That's how intense this, project was bringing the statue here. The statue was coming here and they decided when they were building the church that they want to remember that time, that historical moment when the church was being built and how something from Rome was coming to the United States in our neighborhood here. So when they were designing this church, they decided to have a replica of Michelangelo's Pieta placed here in the church. It's a smaller version of the actual statue, but it's cut perfectly exactly as if it was the, the original statue. As you can tell, it's all polished. It's a single block of marble, and it's, it's cut exactly the way Michelangelo chiseled out that original uh, statue. And even down to the point where Mary's band that goes across her chest, it has all of what Michelangelo engraved in there, because when Michelangelo did the statue, it was put out on display, and he was there, and 
if you listen to the people talk about it, and they said, oh, this artist did that, this artist did that, this artist did that. He was so upset, he locked himself in the church and he carved into that band that he himself made that statue. It's the only signed uh, artwork of Michelangelo's. The only one? Only one. Wow. It is absolutely breathtaking. It's yes. beautiful. And the people here really appreciate the beauty of it and its presence here because it tells the historical time when this church was being built and the people who were here at that time. Wow. I, 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 I'm at a loss for words because I'm looking at it. It's an exact replica. Yes. If you want a perfect exact replica of it, there's one in the lobby at the Immaculate Conception Center. And the actual base that the statue sat on at the World's Fair is the base that the statue is sitting on at, right now at the Immaculate Conception Center. What work went into this? It's oh, yeah. Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah. Wow, the history alone. And, and that's, that's when he was a young artist, too, at the young, time. It's such a tribute and, and such a breathtaking statue here to have at your church. It's, it's yes. There are people who come in, into the church, uh, they'll go around and they'll pray to the different shrines and statues because the statues are, you know, help in aiding in prayer and everything. And there are a number of people who stop here and pause and, and pray in front of the statue here, especially during Holy Week. Father, I want to thank you so much for inviting me and City of Churches to come in here and see this beautiful church. Uh, Mary's Nativity, St. Anne's Parish is, is one of them on the list now because We've learned a whole lot, I've learned a lot, and, and such beautiful, beautiful uh, artifacts and, and statues like the Pieta. That's amazing, I, I almost wanna go to Rome now. I wanna go, I wanna go, I've never been there. It's a worthwhile trip. I, I wanna go, and the fact that the ceiling was made to look like Noah's Ark, an upside down ship, which I did not know, and it's fascinating, the stained glass windows, your Stations of the Cross, your baptismal font that we talked about. I want to thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show, and I hope you learned a lot because I sure did. And if you have any questions about this church, please follow us on netnewyork.tv or Facebook or Twitter, or you can write into us at City of Churches, 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. Until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Anthony Mangano, and God bless you.